final broadcast of the spring semester. I'm Dylan Hyman. And I'm Chloe Winters. Tonight, local innovators are recognized for their inventions. Uh, plus, the Venango teen survives the earthquake in Nepal. That is our top story tonight on CUTV News. Uh, Megan McCandless, a teenager from Kenner Kennerdale, Venango County, was in Nepal on a mission trip during the tragic earthquake. She arrived in Kathmandu on April 16th with the group youth with a mission to attend the worship service when the magnitude 7.8 earthquake hit. Megan survived the disaster and promptly posted a message on social media saying, quote, I don't have Wi-Fi for long, so if I don't have time to reply to you, just know that I am alive and well. It's definitely been a few crazy days. God definitely saved our lives on Saturday. Tomorrow at 12 p.m. will mark the 72-hour mark after the earthquake, and after that we can all breathe a little easier knowing that we are completely safe. She is expected to return home after the mission trip ends in June. State police based in Dubois say two people were injured in a vehicle crash involving a train that occurred last night in Washington Township, Jefferson County. According to police, 20-year-old Laura J. Dressler of Dubois was traveling eastbound on Old Grade Road when she failed to yield to a train that was traveling northbound on the railroad tracks that inter intersected her route. The BNP train struck Dressler's vehicle on the front passenger side, causing her car to roll several times before coming to a complete stop. Dressler and her passenger, 31-year-old John E. Carlson III of Brockway, suffered injuries and were taken to the local hospital for treatment. She was cited with a traffic violation. Marionville Bay State Police report that an incident of alleged aggravated assault and attempted sexual assault happened the night of April 27th across from the Kelly Hotel and Restaurant in Marionville, Forest County. The assault occurred between 10.05 p.m. and 10.20 p.m. and involved a female Kelly Hotel employee. According to police, the employee exited the entrance of the hotel and crossed South Forest Street. She was putting a bag of trash in a dumpster when two unknown white males allegedly grabbed her and directed her to the back of the dumpster. The victim was allegedly pushed to the ground on her back and physically assaulted. The perpetrators then attempted to sexually assault her, but were spooked and let the victim go. According to police, the men fled the scene in an unknown direction. The investigation is ongoing. Clarion police say 21-year-old Tyler J. Walker faces multiple charges after two alleged DUI hit-and-run crashes on April 23rd in Elk Township, Clarion County. According to a criminal complaint, Walker allegedly drove off the roadway, hit a guide rail, and crashed through a, a residential yard before fleeing the scene. After that, later that night, Walker allegedly crashed his 2004 Hyundai Tiburon into an embankment and fled the scene again. Walker was transported by police back to the scene of the second crash. During the course of the night, the investigation determined that two family members had allegedly attempted to take the keys away from the ignition of Walker's vehicle to keep him from driving any further. Police were able to track him down and arrest him on DUI and property damage charges. His preliminary hearing is set for May 5th. Franklin Bay State Police acted in response to a domestic dispute early this morning in Roswell Borough, Venango County. Police say around 12.30 year old Thomas Eugene Kramer of Rouseville physically assaulted the Kramer was charged with $150,000 bail. Unable to post that bail, he was taken into the Venango County Jail. Six entrepreneurs were awarded a total of $75,000 by the Northwestern Pennsylvania Innovation Support Program. They were also given complimentary access to Clarence University's innovation laboratories and professional consulting support for their innovative product development. Some of the innovators include John Brooks with a new building installation to satisfy new building codes, Jason Strom with an education web application, and C. Scott Gilbert with a confidential suicide and abuse hotline application. The program works with Clarion University's Innovation Laboratories and the Clarion University Small Business Development Center to assist new companies and individuals with their new age ideas. Well, it was certainly a beautiful day out there today. Hopefully, a uh, little glimpse of what's more to come. Lauren Healy joins us now over on the uh, green screen for the last time here for her final brother report. Hey, Lauren. Yes, so sad the waterworks are coming just like the rain, guys. And I'm going to step out of the way here. As you can see, Becker Hall, where it all began, where it all happens right here in the studio. Um, beautiful day. The sun was out. Um, a little bit chilly to start the day. Um, but again, it came off for some nice temperatures throughout. Um, coming up next, I'll have your full forecast coming up. Stay tuned. Hey, good evening, Clarion. I'm Lauren Healy here with your final weather Wednesday night forecast as we're going to start off with the almanac 
Today's normal, we had a high of 68 degrees and a low of 51. Our actuals, a little bit chillier than that, at a high of 66 degrees and a low of 46. Our records at one point were 92 degrees is the high and a chilly 19 degrees is the low. The sun rose this morning at 6.19 a.m. and is expected to set later tonight at 8.12 p.m. Right now we're looking at a very comfortable 65 degrees, partly cloudy conditions. Winds are coming out of the east northwest at 5 miles per hour, and there's a 0% chance of precipitation. So if you have time, get out and enjoy this weather. Current conditions across the great Keystone State right here at Clarion, 65 degrees. Up in Erie, a little bit chillier at 58 degrees. Down in Pittsburgh, 67. Over here we have State College, 68. Down in Johnstown, 65. And over in Harrisburg, 69 degrees. For our overnight, again, the waterworks are coming after this broadcast. So is the rain. 46 degrees for this overnight. Showers throughout. Um, winds are coming out of the north at 6 miles per hour. And there's a 50% chance of rain, so be ready for that. For tomorrow, again, same story, unfortunately. Um, again, with finals coming, you know, lots of rain coming up. Um, thunderstorms, a high of 58 degrees, so a lot, a lot ch um, chillier than, a lot chillier today. Winds are coming out of the east, west east at six miles per hour, and there's a 100% chance of precipitation, so make sure you bring your, um, your umbrella to class. Tomorrow's highs across the great country that we live in, down here in Dallas, 81. Over here in Omaha, 74. Denver, 78. Down in Phoenix, Arizona, a whopping 100 degrees. Over here we have Boston, 57. Down in D.C., 71. And over in Miami, 86 degrees. And for your eight-day outlook, again, rain tomorrow, unfortunately. Friday and Saturday, same story. The rain's going to be coming. Um, hopefully it'll help students, you know, with their final exams actually wanting to study. 64 degrees as the high for Friday, and then Saturday, the, the temperatures just keep on rising. 68 degrees Saturday for Sunday, we have 70 degrees, partly cloudy skies. Monday, again, partly cloudy as well. A high of 75, which is going to be um, the high that we see for the week. So the temperatures are nice, and then we have Tuesday and Wednesday with some more rain. Thursday, partly cloudy skies, and a high of 75 degrees. Well, I'm going to take that Thursday and 75 and mostly sunny for like a pretty good lead into graduation week, and I think that it's going to be pretty good, hopefully. I really hope so. It would just be nice to, you know, be able to go outside after our graduation, take pictures, and I know we mentioned this earlier, but remember Clary and how it never was. It, exactly. Yeah. How sunny and beautiful. How we, you never know what it is. What yeah. is it? Sunshine and great, great weather. I don't know what it is. None but, of us do. All right, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so. Lauren. A false positive on a breast cancer exam can be a frightening thing. But a new 3D test could reduce those false readings and allow doctors to catch the cancer early. Holly Furfer has the details in today's Health Minute. About a year ago, Ivory Poozer had a routine mammogram. What followed a few weeks later was not so routine. I got a letter, and, and the letter stated that I think something is not showing up on your tests is being normal. A return visit and another mammogram proved there was no cause for concern. But Ivory, like thousands of women each year, had to handle a very frightening experience, a false positive screening. Now new technology could lower those false positives by 20 to 40 percent. The newest instrument utilizes 3D technology. In traditional 2D imaging, we used to look at the breast from one side of the breast to the other. What digital tomosynthesis lets us do is actually open the book and look at pages of the breast, one page at a time, each being a millimeter of breast tissue, so that we can actually peer into the breast tissue in a much deeper fashion to separate normal from abnormal and get a more accurate diagnosis. Because they can see so much more detail, doctors are able to find smaller abnormal cells very early on. If we can find them at around a centimeter, which is 10 millimeters, I think we're doing a good job. Excellent opportunity for cure, excellent opportunity for a small cosmetic procedure, a lumpectomy and not a mastectomy. For today's Health Minute, I'm Holly Furfer. Coming up, multiple shootings have been reported in the Pittsburgh area. Plus a huge drug bust worth thousands of dollars. As we go to break, here's a look at today's stocks.
Welcome back, everyone. Moving into some Pittsburgh news now. Police arrested a man wanted in, in connection with a shooting in Edgewood Town Center in March after a car chase on Tuesday night. Officers attempted to pull over 19-year-old Montel Mitchell's car on Braddock Avenue in the east side of the city. Mitchell instead led police on a chase that ended when Mitchell drove through a yard and rolled into a parked car on Wolf Avenue. Mitchell and his passenger attempted to run, but police caught up with them. Mitchell was wanted as being part of a shootout in Edgewood Town Center on March 19th. A warrant was issued for Mitchell for attempted homicide, aggravated assault, and seven counts of reckless endangerment. He also had heroin and pills on him when he was arrested. He was taken to the Allegheny County Jail. Wilkinsburg police are investigating after multiple shots were fired and a vehicle hit a house early this morning. Witnesses say three people were leaving a party and got into their car when an unknown person came out of the woods and started shooting an AK-47. The victims took off, but the car stalled on Grand Avenue, so they were forced to flee on foot. When police arrived, they found that the car was covered in bullet holes and had struck a home. Police also found a gun inside the abandoned car. Several other cars in the area also had bullet holes, however, there were no reported victims. Police haven't found the shooter yet, and anyone with information is asked to call Wilkinsburg Police. Police in Arnold had recovered over $4,000 worth of heroin from a home on Fifth Avenue. Police officers found eight bricks and two bundles of the drug with a street value of $4,400, as well as $4,300 in cash, 250 prescription pills, and $40 worth of K2. The home belongs to 24-year-old Jordan Jackson. He is now facing multiple drug charges. Police say they received an anonymous tip alerting them to the drugs in Jackson's apartment. Pittsburgh police and the SWAT team responded to a domestic dispute in Sheridan this morning. A man allegedly fired a shot inside a home with three children, and authorities reported that the incident started at the home in the 200 and 2700 excuse me, block of Bergman Street around 7 a.m. The dispute began between a man and a woman. The man allegedly brought out a gun and fired a shot during the conflict. The woman and her two children escaped the home. She got out by telling her boyfriend she needed to get clothes for the baby from their neighbor. The man surrendered without incident at around 10 a.m. and he was identified as 20-year-old Doc McKenna's fielder. No injuries have been reported. A mining accident in Westmoreland County has left three mine workers injured, but officials are staying quiet as to how those workers got hurt in the first place. Calls came in to 911 around 5 o'clock this morning, and paramedics were requested at the scene of the Whitney Stone Quarry on Unity Township. Two people had to be flown by helicopter to Pittsburgh hospitals. The third person was taken away by ambulance. The general manager of the mine has not released any statement on how the accident occurred. Federal mine safety inspectors arrived at that mine earlier today. Springdale Borough Police Chief Julio Medeiros was, has written a harsh letter addressed to the borough solicitor asking for help to end reportedly unethical behavior by some local elected officials. Medeiros told a borough council meeting on Tuesday night that the letter he sent out was not supposed to be made public and someone leaked the information. The chief wrote in the letter that he was being bullied and slandered. Medeiros wrote that an unnamed councilwoman once approached him and used a racial slur. Medeiros has been the Springdale Borough Chief of Police for the last year and a half. A father in Greenfield is being credited with saving his son's life after a fire broke out in the family home. The house on Greenfield Avenue broke out in flames earlier this morning and was confined to an area on the third floor. Pittsburgh Fire Bureau Chief says the father attempted to put the fire out while he was on the third floor trying to get his son out of danger. The father and son were both taken to the hospital for treatment. The name of the family is not being released at this time. Fire officials inspected that home and found that smoke detectors in the home were in fact working. The cause of that blaze is still under investigation. A brand new upscale 74-unit apartment complex will be making its debut in just over a year. The groundbreaking ceremony for the flats on 5th was yesterday morning. Plans for the development originally began in 2011, but zoning issues forced the developers back until right now. Pittsburgh Mayor Bill Peduto said he feels the new apartments will change the look of the Forbes and Fifth Avenue corridor. Rent prices will range from $1,200 to $1,500. Castlebrook development officials say that the complex will be geared to target graduate students and young professionals. And Max Trillo joins us now for his final sports report. And Matt, what do you got for us tonight? I can't believe that, guys. Well, we've been talking about all the turmoil going on in Baltimore, unfortunately, this week. And their baseball team's been affected uh, quite much uh, like so. We'll, we'll talk about that. First time something happened in MLB history. We'll talk about that next. Plus, we'll get into some NBA playoffs and some Pirates highlights in Chicago against the Cubs. Next in sports.
Good evening, Clarion. I'm Matt Catrilla with your final and Wednesday night sports report. It's been in the Baltimore Orioles continue to have their schedule interrupted with all of their unfortunate protest and rioting going on in their city. Today's Slayer, game against the literally. Chicago White Sox was moved Diego. to a 205 he start with the game closed to the, the public by Major League tough. Baseball. This was the first time in league history a game was played without public access. Fans, however, stood outside the ballpark cheering on their team. The O's got the win 8-2. to The MLB made this ruling to preserve the safety of the teams and fans with some of the protesting occurring just three miles from Camden Yards. The first two postponed games from this series were moved to late May. The O's weekend series with the Tampa Bay Rays is being moved to Tropicana Field. It's been an up and down start to the season for the Pirates, but a sweep of the D-backs showed maybe they finally got the early season cobwebs out of them. But after being blanked last night, the Bucks still have some work to do to get in the form everybody expects of them now. Let's go to Wrigley as they continue the series with the Cubs. And the Cubs also looking for their fourth straight win. Go to the bottom of the second, one nothing Cubbies. Dexter Fowler at the plate, and he's going to single two right. That scores two runs. Junior Lake and... Addison Russell, come on down as the Cubs lead a 3 0 throw to second is way offline. That allows Dexter Fowler to go over to third. Bottom of the third now, same score. Junior Lake at the plate this time as he scores in from first. He's going to drill this Jeff Locke pitch down the left field line into the corner. That's going to star score Starling Castro. An RBI double off a of lock for Junior Lake, and the Cubs lead it 4 0. Top of the seventh, Cubs up 6 2 now. And Travis Wood continues to deal against the Pirates. Neil Walker at the plate. And whoops, Francisco Cervelli. Goodbye. Thank you for playing. Sean Rodriguez, it's been our pleasure serving you. Wood with nine strikeouts as he strikes out the side in that inning. Allows two runs off five hits, going seven strong. Cubs get, do get their fourth straight win. Starling Marte with the only offense for the Pirates with a two-run home run. The final game of this series tonight at 8.05. Let's go now to the NBA playoffs. Western Conference quarterfinals. The Clippers taking on the Spurs. First quarter, L.A. up by five. Chris Paul gets it ahead to Blake Griffith for the monster dunk, and the Clippers lead it by seven. Jump to the third. Spurs up by two. Paul finding Griffith this time for another easy lay-in. We're tied at 76. Blake with 30 points on the night. Fourth quarter now with the Spurs up by four. Tim Duncan with his famous shot he's been doing his entire career. Just clutch as he knocks down the mid-range jumper. He finishes with 21. Later in the fourth, Griffin with the ball. And the alley-oop to DeAndre Jordan. Look at those hops. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. As that cuts the, the San Antonio lead to a deuce. And then 6.9 to go. Blake with the impounds pass, floats the jumper, and then Dion Jordan tips it in while it's still in the cylinder, so the basket's weighed off, as you see right there, pretty clear. And that's a big blow to the Lake, to the Clippers, rather, as they fall to the Spurs, 111 to 107. Spurs take a 3 to 2 series lead, game six in San Antonio, Thursday night at 9.30. We go now to Texas, and the other two Texas teams battling it out. The Mavs looking to avoid a sweep from the Rockets, third quarter, Houston up by 10. Josh Smith with the drive, misses the lane, but Dwight Howard there for the putback slam. Dallas, though, not going away without a fight. Monta Ellis, dribbling around, gets the pass, and knocks down the tree to cut the lead down to seven. Fourth quarter now, Rockets up nine. Dirk with the pump fake, moves in right on the elbow, and swish as he knocks down the mid-range jumper as he tries to keep his team in it, but in the end, just too much blast off from the Rockets as James Harden leading the way. Step back three, man, that is just not fair. Ew, that is just disgusting. And then three on one the other way off the steal by Harden as he drives it over to Terrence Jones and dishes it out, and Jones finishes with the exclamation point of authority. The Rockets sweep the Mavs 103 to 94. It is the first playoff series win for the Rockets since 2009 as they move on to the Western Conference semifinals. So, guys, a lot going on. It's a great time in the year. We have the NFL draft tomorrow night, too. You can check out the draft show that we did uh, last week with myself, Tyler DeGiacomo and Alex Cazora uh -huh. on YouTube. We got any last minute questions for the draft. So, uh, it wouldn't be a last Macachilla broadcast if you didn't have a little bit of self endorsement there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to be a last Shameless time. plug, shameless <laughs> plug, right. always. Yes, right. But, but thank you, you guys, for a great ride here the last four years. Oh, it's been a pleasure having you, Matt. Great. We'll, have, we'll have a little bit more to say at the end of the show. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, but thank you very much, Matt, thank for you. sports. Moving on to some national news now, Baltimore is starting to quiet down finally after a curfew was imposed last night. The hope now is that the city can begin the healing process after violence all this week. Ryan Nobles has more details from Baltimore. An uneasy peace has taken hold in Baltimore. Get back, get back. Nearly an hour after the 10 p.m. curfew, police fired smoke canisters and pepper bullets and chased away a mostly peaceful crowd. Just 10 people arrested compared to the more than 200 the night before. Helping keep the peace are some 2,000 National Guard troops. 
Others say the piece was due to the community itself, including clergy and gang members. So I'm very pleased that the community is standing on the front line saying this is not going to be the record of what Baltimore is written for. Meanwhile, Baltimore police expect to have a report on the death of Freddie Gray completed this week. His death while in police custody sparked the unrest. Congressman Elijah Cummings says the disenfranchised will only be ignored for so long. Baltimore can happen anywhere. And you've got people looking at us right now saying, oh, that'll never happen in my community. But yes, it will. But you've got to have people to listen, and you've got to begin to act on it. President Obama spoke out on the violence this morning, telling radio host Steve Harvey police-related deaths must stop. Like any other profession, there are times where folks aren't doing what they should be doing. And that's true of politicians. It's true of police officers. In Baltimore, I'm Ryan Nobles reporting. A Texas A&M professor made national headlines last week by vowing to fail his entire class. Among other things, the professor told students in an email that they were all a disgrace to the school. Now the school is stepping in, saying that the students won't get an automatic F. Samantha Patashkin reports. I have never failed a class. He's the professor putting Texas A&M Galveston in the national spotlight. Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, NBC, to the Today Show. Last week, Dr. Erwin Horwitz sent his strategic management class an email. It said he planned to fail all of his students because of everything from cheating to inappropriate conduct. He's grouped us together and is punishing the masses for the actions of a few. Senior Caleb Massey was livid when he heard the news. Now he and other students are trying to fight for their reputations. We can't just sit by the wayside and let him destroy our academic careers. We've got to stand up for what we know is right. While Massey and other students say Horwitz is a gifted teacher. He's very, very smart. He knows a lot about the things that he teaches about. They say he went too far in trying to punish his class. All of the adjectives that he's hurled at us, that we've been incompetent, was just wrong in my opinion. Today the university sent this statement saying quote, the report that all students will be failed is not correct. Each student will receive an individual grade based upon work completed during the semester. Of course it's a relief to students but there's still concern that the damage has already been done. Interviews, is this a question that's going to be asked? Were you in Erwin Horwitz's class at Texas A&M? And we did try reaching out to Professor Horowitz today to get his reaction about all of the attention he's receiving because of this, but we have not heard back. Reporting from Galveston, Samantha Patashkin, KPRC Channel 2 News. All right, so lots of young children love dinosaurs, but not many actually get to discover a whole new dinosaur species. Researchers in Chile unveiled the bones of a Chileosaurus this week. Remains of the Jurassic era dinosaur were discovered by a seven year old boy in southern Chile more than a decade ago. It has three thick, short fingers, but only two claws. The dinosaur also has short, leaf shaped teeth, which means it was a plant eater. Paleontologists estimate the Chileosaurus roamed the earth about 150 million years ago. A South Jersey cat named Sprinkles has gained a noticeable amount of fame over her sizable figure. Sprinkles is a domestic short hair cat who weighs in at an incredible 33 pounds. If she were a regular cat, Sprinkles would weigh in at about 10 pounds. What she actually weighs is the equivalent of a human tipping the scales at 600 or 700 pounds. After being surrendered when her homeowners was foreclosed on, she's now in the hands of the nonprofit group SOS, Sea Isle City Cats. This extra large cat was too big for the county animal shelter to handle and was moved to SOS in a dog carrier. Whoops. Who works locally and he carried her up the steps for us. He said, why? We couldn't lift her. Her little feet should be together and they're grossly wide apart. And from being hardly able to stand, she can now waddle a little bit. Huge, huge. <laughs> it, it's, it's a big cat and I proclaimed it Seal's top cat. SOS group suspects that Sprinkles may have been used, used to eating table scraps and Sprinkles will eventually go up for adoption. But right now she's on a strict diet of four cans of cat food a day. 
SOS believes it will take up to a year and a half to get her back to a normal weight. Can you believe that, guys? I think, well, of course, <laughs> I feel bad for Sprinkles because someone made her that way, unfortunately. You know, just don't give your cats all that much food. All right, we're in the home stretch here, people. Almost time to say our goodbyes, but one last look at the forecast from Lauren Healy. All righty, guys, let's check it out. Like I said, tomorrow um, we're going to see thunderstorms throughout the day, 100% chance of rain. Your umbrella to class, wear your raincoat, do whatever you have to do. And again, the temperatures are going to be dropping a little bit, so tomorrow's going to be a lot chillier than it was um, today. And then Friday and Saturday, the rain will continue. 64 degrees and 68 is the high. Sunday and Monday, we'll get a break in the rain. Um, 70 degrees as the high on Sunday, and Monday is high of 75 degrees. So we, we do have some good weather to look forward to. But then, unfortunately, that changes. Tuesday and Wednesday, some more rain. And then Thursday, partly cloudy skies and a high of 75 degrees. So things are looking up. Looking up definitely, and you know, it's a, a great way to end, I think, the last four years, us being on this desk. And I'll just start with the sentimentalness. I think that it doesn't seem like it was all that long ago that we were all just standing as the crew when we saw Matt Knather and Britt Seahall and all of them sitting on this desk saying their goodbyes. And it's kind of weird that we're the ones doing it now, isn't mm -hmm. it, Lauren? It really is. It does, I don't think it's going to feel real until next week or something when we're not all down here working exactly constantly on the broadcast something like i don't even know if it's going to hit me until august when i'm like oh, yeah, i'm supposed to be true. getting ready to go back to school <laughs> no i'm not do that. yeah matt yeah it's just i'm gonna miss like coming back and not be doing shows every week is we don't know where everything's gonna lead for for us but uh i know we've, we've all made a lot of great memories uh thanks to you guys here and alex is our director Todd to giacomo yeah. Kelsey, always uh, not forget anybody. Uh, so it's it's All been, been a fun run, guys. I really enjoyed uh, working with you guys down here, and we put together a lot of good quality broadcast. I think for the mm -hmm. viewers here and the uh, Claren University era to enjoy. I think so, Chloe. I agree. Uh, I don't know. I just I'm not I'm still in denial. So uh, I just think <laughs> that without um, the incredible freshman class that we had this year, we yeah, wouldn't be able absolutely. to uh, do any of the things that we've been able to do. So um, Eric, Emily, Jenny. Um, missing like a thousand other people, but uh, who else? Michaela. Oh, Michaela. oh yeah, Michaela, Michaela well, she's Caitlin, sophomore, Caitlin. But you know, all the newer people, Caitlin, of course, and, and uh, everyone. Tara. Yeah, and uh, everyone that, that just joined us, Cody. Thank you. George just gonna name everybody. Yeah. Everyone Adam? here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they just did a, such a phenomenal job this year, and I'm really, I'm, we're lucky to have them. Exactly, and I think you know, don't you worry. Uh, next semester, you're going to have just the same quality news. It's mm -hmm. going to be just as fun. There's going to be a whole bunch of new faces, we think. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like Matt said, th this doesn't all happen without, of course, uh, Mr. Alex Kazora upstairs. He's always the one who gets us down to be serious when we need to, when we <laughs> sometimes have a little too much fun during the commercial break, and really all the crew mm -hmm. and anyone who's ever come down and sat on. Uh, done the camera, the teleprompter, really anything we all really appreciated, and mm -hmm. um, it's just been a really great ride. And so, mm -hmm. I yes. think I think that's that's just the way to end it. Okay. Yeah, so so. <laughs> all right, that is a wrap. That's the way it is for our final broadcast of the year. And of course, be sure to tune in next semester for the latest and greatest always in news, weather, and sports, and everything else going on down here at CUTV. For Lauren Healy, Matt Catrillo, and all of the seniors here at CUTV. I'm Dylan Hyman. And I'm Chloe Winter. So long, Clary, and it's been real. <laughs>